modem or a, a 10 megabit connection, what can you do with, you know, why would you upgrade from 10 megabit to 100 megabit? What does that mean? What is a bit? How many bits are you sending? Um, if you go into 24 bit color mode, is that better than 16 bit color mode? And how much better? Uh, and the answer is 256 times better. Right? Um, if you have 128 bit encryption and you're talking to the bank, um, you know, how, how many different 128 bit numbers are there if someone wanted to attack it? And the answer is heaps. Um, if you have a 16, if, you're, if your audio player has 16 bit audio. And so the students could attack, you know, whatever device they pick, you know, here, it will have some number of bits. You know, even a garage door opener, my garage door opener has 8 bit codes on it. And so if I cycled through all 8 bits, I would probably be able to open someone else's garage door with it, right? Uh, how many 8 bit numbers are there? And, and so that's, that's encryption, and that's security, um, and so on. And, and so, <coughs> um, okay, so that's that bit. Encoding, obviously, you know, iPods and MP3 players um, use MP3 or AAC coding. What's the difference between them? Which one's better? That sort of thing. Uh, JPEG on cameras. So, you know, how much is a, how much smaller is a photograph as a JPEG that can be, or say, a, a TIFF or a GIF or a, um, you know, and why do we do? And, and, and you said that obviously the media people are already talking about a lot of these things anyway. The computer scientists are saying, well, what are we actually going to do with this? So that we can look after the media people and they'll pay us lots of money for converters and adapters and stuff like that. Uh, HTTPS, you know, when you get a secure connection on the web, and, and again, you know, this will tie in with um, the web standards and so on. But, um, what's it actually mean when you're using HTTPS instead of HTTP? Um, PGP, especially for mail and so on, um, they're pretty, it's pretty good privacy. Um, it's a free encryption system. You can Put your files through it, download it, put files through it, and it's pretty good. The US government probably can't crack it. Uh, <laughs> that's what they mean by pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, it's, but it's not guaranteed to be super, super good, but it's, it's, it's sufficient and fast and free and so on. Um, and MD5 signatures, you know, so you, a lot of your students have probably downloaded stuff and they have an MD5 signature that it's verified that the downloaders work correctly and so on. And how does that work? And it's not hard. Um, uh, barcodes, which, which people look at today, um, you know, there's a check digit on a barcode so that when it's scanned, you know, if there's an error in the scanning, it can actually just say, hey, you know, error in scanning, rather than going, oh, okay, you've just scanned a different product, I'll charge that up to your grocery bill. Um, so, and then, and then the third area, usability, um, you know, again, all these devices, you know, even three players, like players, whatever, um, have interfaces that people try and use, and some of them are fantastic to use, and some of them are horrible to use, um, and so, you know, I think the exemplar computer does all of this with a, a cheap Dick Smith, doesn't say that exemplar, um, uh, MP3 player, and so the MP3 player you know, stores some number of bytes, it encodes them using MP3 and WAVE and some other format, I think. Um, and it is horrible to use, and it's pretty easy to find examples. Now, and for usability, you're always going to be asking, what are the tasks someone's going to do with this device? You know, so, and, and this is a good question. You know, so what are, what are the tasks that people do with this device? Switch it on. Switch it off. Freeze the picture. Freeze the picture. Mute it. Mute it. Change the input. Change the input. Just start. Just oh yeah okay, yeah yeah focus it and adjust it and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Wouldn't be a common task No. Add task. That's right. And now we start thinking about what are the common tasks. And then especially if you get something like uh, I mean, a remote control for a TV. What are the tasks people do with remote controls for TVs? Volume and channel. Volume and channel. Yeah. What do all the other buttons do? I don't know. It just looked good when I was buying it, and so I paid more for it, right? <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. That's one of the most unusable things in the world is remote controls for video TVs and videos and things like that. Um, they're designed to sell on functionality. You know, you can record this while you're out, you can delete this, you can edit videos, you can do all sorts of stuff. Almost no one does because it's unusable. So, so anyway, it's totally focused on, it has to be focused on tasks. A really bad you know, evaluation would say, oh, this video remote control um, has got edit, it's got this, it's got record while you're 
stack, it's got over data, it's got under data, it's got super data, whatever. Um, so yeah, it's a very cool interface. Uh, it's not a real, you know, give it to, and, and typically a parent is going to be very close to try it out and say, oh, just do a double underdone, you know, see the something or other with this remote, and you'll soon find out whether it's usable. Um, so that, that's what that's about. And, and, and it's a very, a very practical way to find out why people pay, um, you know, a thousand dollars for an iPhone rather than a hundred dollars for a, you know, a cheap phone or something like that. Um, and now, <coughs> In fact, even cell phones and things are often sold on functionality rather than usability. And so we want yeah, your yeah, functionality. Uh, there's so much stuff around. We, um, we've had issues at our university where we've got software that's got functionality, but it's not usable. And you know, the users who are sort of starting things on complain and say, I can't get my job done with this. You know, I have to do 14 clicks just to bring up a student record. Yeah, and, and they say, oh, dumb teachers, look, it's very easy. Click here, click here, do this, do this, you can do that. Now, is there anything else you can't do on it? Okay, that's easy. Click here, do this, do five of those, and click that there, and hold that at the same time, and we'll do that as well. Don't know what you're complaining about, it does everything you need to do. Yeah. And, 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 and the trouble is, of course, your students who just learn to program and say, oh, you want something that does this. Okay. And, and, you must see this, I've seen it in student projects, they say, oh, for up you have to hold down these two keys, and for down you hold down these two unrelated keys, and for to quick you hold these five keys at the same time, or something like that. And it, it was kind of like, why did you do that? And it's like, oh, it was easy to program. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so you know, think of what, uh, what people are frustrated about. And, you know, what, <coughs> what do people prefer, and why do they like it? And it's often more to do with It'll be still all of this. You know. It's got great capacity. It's not always running out of room. It's not, you know, it, it runs fast. Um, it's secure or it's small or it's whatever you can require here. And it's even to do this. So, so this standard actually does make for a great project. Um, pick a device that's got all these aspects. Um, but what I'm going to focus on now for the next 45 minutes, is it? Yeah. Um, is I'll just go through each of the elements of the standard. I'll, I'll, I'll start with firing because um, most, most of you are comfortable with it. Um, the, the unplugged method that we use, and so, um, and, and this really was designed for five year olds. Time for some exercise. How about we get uh, the five people over here could stand up? That would be great. Um, I mean, how many of you have seen the sun plug binary thing? So normally what I do is I give a card to every student, uh, sorry, set of cards for every student in the class, and they get to say our inquiry numbers, but we're going to actually get you to be the five cards. Um, and so over here we have, each is a bit, the zero or one, black or white, on or off, and it goes through by many of those. So on the right hand side we have the least significant bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which I find is actually quite memorable because people are always going to, you know, whenever you say where's the least significant bit in the future, it's always going to be like, it's Patrick. Do you have access to a counsellor? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, the, the next bit is worth two. Um, I'm constructed this at heart, so I just say, what's the next one going to be? Three. Three is what the students will pull out. And I just silently give them four. And everyone goes, what? <laughs> Not because they're too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, but but then okay. So yeah. what, what's the next one they're going to call out? Okay. Six, exactly. All right. And then, but, but, but a few, and, and these are the computer scientists in the class will be arguing that that's going to be eight, and then suddenly everyone's on to sixteen, and, and and we can keep on going. Oh, thank you very much. Excellent. Um, Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so then um, what we do is we say, okay, each card's black or white. Um, I want to have nine dots showing. So if you and, and yeah, okay, you know, do it. We'll go through and see. And, and they've got often the cards in front of them. Do you want to have a sixteen showing? No. No. Eight. Yeah. Yes. Four. No. Two. No. no. One. Yes. And, and so. The, what the students have just said, and usually the whole class will yell us out, it's pretty obvious, but they've just said no, yes, no, no, yes, and point out that was a binary number. Okay, you've just used two symbols, no and yes, and you've told me it's a number nine. Uh, 
Now I'm going to tell you a number, uh, which is going to be yes, yes, no, no, yes. What was the number? 25. Yeah. 25. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's questions like, are there other ways to do 25 using these cards? So, to show all the cards, and uh, is there another way to do 25? Well, could you do it if you didn't have the 16? No, there's only 15 blocks left. Okay, so we have to have the 16. Okay, now we're starting to actually reason about these binary numbers. We've got a have to here. Could you do it without the 8? Well, if we lose the 8, we've only got 16 and 7 left, so no, that would never be enough, so we have to have the 8. Could we do it with the 4? Because you said without the 4 before. No. Because. Really right, so sorry, we have to not have the 4. Do you want the 2? No. No, because it would be too many. And, and, and we have to have the one. And so suddenly, now, now the class has told you we have to do it that way with every single bit. There is only one way to represent the number 25. Now you could go through every possible number, but I think after a while. Now you could have just said to them, oh, there is a unique representation of every number in the binary number system. Okay. Uh, which is a lot more boring than saying, do we have to have Patrick? Do we get as it happens, we do. So it's good. Uh, and in fact, what's special about the numbers that Patrick is holding? You know. Yeah, all the old ones, right? Yeah, okay. You have to be careful how you use this in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but keep bear in mind that the, the way I do it with the class is I have each student have a set of five cards in front of them, and they would be doing this themselves. So that, right, but this is a good, good way to introduce it. Uh, Okay, if I would ask your class what's the smallest number they can do, what answer am I likely to get? We're likely to get one. Well, exactly. And then a little, in fact, it happens almost every time. Then there's a pause for about one second, and then about three people yell out zero. Yeah. Um, and then everyone else is convinced. And then, yeah. And, and then we can do, you can do counting, you count up through the cards, and that's quite instructive actually doing it. Um, so we'll, actually, we'll do it. It is about three four weeks. So one, two, <laughs> it, it's really hard. Right. Uh, it's yeah. an odd number you're talking about. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Now, now, with the kids actually doing it, and students doing it in front of them on the table, you know, they'll start to see some of the patterns that occur and what they have to do is have them happen. Sort of stuff. And particularly when we've got uh, here at 15, which is the, the four of you there, um, without the 16, another pattern that they'll recognize, um, so it's, sorry, so it's all white, yeah, uh, except here, uh, is that the next number after 15 is 16. In fact, when you've, when you've got a whole lot of white in a row, the next number is one more. So now, what's, if we look at what's the maximum number, so if you show all the cards as white, what would be the next number after this one, if I had a card here? 32. 32. So the number of dots here must be 31. 31. Okay. Um, and meanwhile, some other kids will be on one. And, and, and they'll be right. But, you know, you know, if you do the cards, you know, I've got more and more cards here, and suddenly it makes a lot of sense to start doing those little short cards. And so, in fact, that we can do them. Um, so we've got 16, 32, 64, 128. Um, so if we had 8 bits, which happens to be called a byte, um, because it's a useful number, what is, how many dots can you see if they move to square? Yeah, you can see, double that number, 256, and it must be one less than that. And so suddenly they've actually worked out for themselves that binary numbers go, the one byte binary number goes from 0 to 255. And, and that's an important concept, and thank you very much. Oh, actually, no, no, we'll see. There's one more thing I want to do. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to know how to do the conversion, which is just, you know, there's an algorithm you can do, you know, do you have it, is it odd, have it, is it odd, and that sort of thing. And yeah. it's easy to do in a spreadsheet, too. Ah, yes, a great spreadsheet exercise. Yeah. Yes. A lot of these things they involve spreadsheets a lot. Uh, measuring compression sizes, you know, write them on the spreadsheet and grab it. Um, and, uh, you know, work out the checksum or something, put them in the spreadsheet, add them up and so on. 
So the great one that you've got with or in a computer program too. So you could write a computer program to work out all these things uh, and use that as a programming exercise. This is the level where it actually starts making sense to actually implement these things as well. So and one of the exercises we've got, and, and this is just more fun, but I don't think it's one of your students might, might enjoy, it, is this, this um, film um, that we put together. It's a couple of you have seen it, I think. Um, Job start or simple. Uh, <laughs> great. Uh, so, this is a nice jazzy piece. It's uh, Susan Dion, she's one of the jazz tutors at Jazz School in town. But what you might have noticed is she's only singing two notes. And so therefore our binary numbers, so let's just decode the first one. Uh, um, a low note is zero and a high note is one. Okay, so we have bo, le, bo, bo, le, bo, bo. And um, so that's, the number is 10. It's actually a code for a letter, it's the 10th letter of the alphabet, uh, which is J. Ready for an next bit? Here it goes. It's on YouTube if you want to decode the whole thing. <laughs> um, but well, more to the point, you know, if your students have learned the binary numbers and they want sort of something to try out at home, um, the Country, um, 
you, you take a, a tourist photo and you encode messages into the photo and just say, here I am in China having a nice time in this wonderful country that is absolutely amazing, superb government, and, and, and hidden in the, in, the, in the text is a different message about it. <laughs> Please tell me the international <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, so, um, yes, so the, the standard sort of says, you know, represent letters, so the ASCII codes, and there's a the difference between ASCII code and Unicode, which is 16 bit codes, um, which can represent all the Asian languages and so on. Um, and again, when you go from 8 bits to 16 bits, you go from, and, and you know, these students can work this out, about 256 different letters to 65,000 different things. Um, how many languages are there? characters out there in Chinese and, and, and so you start to realise that, that going from one byte to two bytes makes a huge you know, difference in thousands. Um, with colours and so on, you know, breaking down images and pixels representing kind of colour. Now the demonstration that they have in their portfolio is more likely to be something like, you know, it was a 24 bit video system or it was a 16 bit um, C D player or something like that and, and just to break down what Meant. But if they've got the odd thing saying, oh, well, 16 bits, obviously the maximum value is this, or, and so on, then suddenly it's very personalised. It's about model such and such um, you know, player uh, rather than just, you know, eight, eight, the maximum of 8 bits is 256, according to Wikipedia. Uh, and so, uh, and, and decoding part of that video would, would, would have probably, to me, quite an impressive uh, exercise in terms of showing that they. They understand binary representations. Um, for someone to really nail the whole thing, they probably need the media students to help out and, and sort of try and filter out drum parts and bass parts and extract things and play it slowly and, and all that sort of stuff as well. So, um, one family has done it, by the way. <laughs> it, by the time you decode it, it gives you a URL and a password um, and you go to that URL and type in the password and it gives you a few more instructions. And if you get through that, it tells you how to claim a prize. Okay. Um, so I won't do any more on binary numbers, but you know, lots of fun to be had. But but also, you know, basically whatever device they choose, they need to be able to figure out you know, where the binary is in it. But if it's a digital device, by definition, it's got binary in it. That's why it's digital. Um, right. Error correction. So how many people send error correction as you track? Nice of you. Who hasn't? Okay, prepare for your first thing. Everyone else here, yeah, that's not good. Um, so if I can get you coming up and give me a hand, actually. Again, um, this one is much better for kids to do it on cards in front of the table, and um, I think I was just saying before, I've, I've managed to persuade my university to print off sets of cards for teachers uh, for free because it's got the university logo on it. Um, so you can um, you know, use, use these for demonstrating. Yeah. Not magnetic ones. If, if you want magnetic ones, which again is better for the students to do it themselves anyway, but this is just for the sort of fresh ones to make ones. Um, Japanese shops, um, so there's one of them um, sell so double sided magnetic card. You, single, you know, fridge magnets don't work upside down, which is kind of. Yeah, who would have thought? Okay, okay so what I'm going to use to do is put these cards up on the wall for me. Um, and just a random mixture of red and white, uh, five by five, five square. Five by five, yeah. um, and blue bit of again. Upside down. No. If, if, if these ones will stick either way. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right, they're not moving or holding up. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was in the United States a couple of weeks ago, and I've been, I, I, they, they took me around a tour of a couple of schools they wanted to see how this was done. They, they, they picked an upper class school, which was very nice, and they, they picked a school in a um, town called Salinas, which is where the drug traffic from Mexico comes to California, uh, and the school is kind of one of those ones that's kind of pretty strict. Like, and in particular, the two that the local gang colors are red and blue, <laughs> <laughs> which I dawned on me just as they were putting up the, the cards. But uh, anyway, no one said anything and I got away with it, but there was a, there was a kid in the headmaster's office when we arrived for having red shoe laces. So, yeah. <laughs> Nothing, the school uniform is black and white. <laughs> you think you got a tough. Okay. Um, so
So, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's meant to read. Actually, I mean, black and white is much better because it relates to the zeros and ones, it's the binaries anyway. It's just I, I still haven't found black and white double sided <coughs> cards. Um, but I'll, if you up here, you could sort of make them paint ones or something. Um, I did make some spray paint ones. So, make ones um, so, so we, we've got a bunch of bits here that, that, that you have chosen, and, and it, it might represent numbers or a story or you know, something. That you can do. Page that's been downloaded, and what I'm going to do is flick one of them over because sometimes the bits get changed. Any, anyone at all? Any, anyone? Yeah, and, but I'm not looking and cover your eyes. Okay, uh, and, and, and the, the challenge is to try and figure out um, which one's been flipped over. And okay, so the, the one you've got would have been that one there. Um, the younger the kids are, the more impressed they are, but the older they are, it's kind of like, oh, I'm too old to get impressed with this. Uh, but how do you do it? <laughs> uh, so, the, the te this technique is, is called uh, parity error correction, and I mean, it, um, some of the guys in the UK who have developed this, they actually do it as a mind reading thing. So, what, what you can actually do is, I could have, one of you who knew it, the technique, if I could have sent you out of the room, we could have done the entire thing, flipped over. Someone comes in and they, and they get you to swap that's the one that's just over. I've never seen anything. Um, and, and the way it works is that if, you know, if the extra cards that I put on, I make sure there's an even number of red cards in the work. So, and, and again, you can go through the kids. So, what colour do we put here? And, and, and so, we've done this with five year olds, and, and it takes a lot longer to say, okay, um, you know, how many red cards are there here? Let's count one. Two, three. Yeah, there's three an even or an odd number. It's in the but, it's, but you know, the teachers in the back going, whoa, even and odd numbers, they actually have a use. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, right, so, and, but with, with all the kids, we just say, what color is here? Yeah. And we do the same in the columns, so, red, red, red. And one of the issues that you have to deal with is that. Zero is an even number. And so when you flip one over, changes it to an odd number. So there's, there's an odd number in that row. One of those is wrong, and there's an odd number in that column. And so it's the institute of the wrong right. one. Now, that technique is, is called. Thanks, thanks for that. Thank you. Um, that technique is called parity error correction. Um, and it's, it's quite an old one, well, it's been around for a long time in computer science. Uh, it's actually still used today on rage disks, so, um, which is, so, so RAID is fairly widely used now, within the array of independent devices, you just have lots of, lots of disks, um, and, um, and, and so the idea is that instead of storing all your data on one disk, um, you, you put one bit of each byte on a different disk. Uh, <coughs> instead of having eight disks, we have nine. The ninth one stores the parity. Uh, and so, before that disk crashed or died or whatever bit it, it stored an important piece of data. But because there was an, always an even number of black, then what, what colour was that one originally? White. And that one was. Yeah. And so, no matter which one of those disks had blown up, you'd be able to quickly go and do some buy a new one, plug it in, and restore it from the others, and, and then finally you're running redundant again. Yeah. So, so that's, that's one mode of RAID operation um, that basically says we can afford for a complete disk crash. Now, if that was the disk drive in your laptop and it crashed, it's all over. You, you go to the backup that you did sometime in the last 24 hours and we go from that. Don't get me started on that. Being a, being a computer scientist, the number of people come up to me and say, I've just lost everything on my disk. Can you get it back? Okay. Well, it's not a good time to laugh, actually. It tends to happen. Well, he needs a backup at home, and it's a good Yeah, and, um, and never have all your, all 
two data in the same place at the same time. There's one guy in the version here that's that's very behind. Right? Um, his backup regime was to bring in a clip drive every Tuesday to work and copy things onto it and then take it home. And so on Tuesday the 22nd, his clip drive and his computer are at work. Luckily, he decided to go to lunch that day, which is particularly lucky because he worked in the Pine Book Guinness building. But his, so he missed out on all the excitement there. But his original data and his backup are now in a rubbish dump somewhere probably. And uh, just, I, I think he's an accountant, so it's like all his clients, all that data, gone. That's it. Uh, contrasting story, a friend of mine was giving a lecture on February the 22nd in a, a hotel next to the Grand Chancellor. And he walked out to, with nothing, not his wallet, not his laptop, nothing, and walked home. And in fact, he was from Wellington, he went back to Wellington, bought a laptop the next day, and was working again uh, because everything was on the cloud. And he just logged in and business as usual. His laptop was still in that hotel next to the Grand Chancellor. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, you might actually get a vaccine. Um, so, yeah, anyway. But, but, but that's, that's parity. Parity isn't used a lot these days, except for some of the things like this. Um, what normally, um, in fact, on, on your actual disk, there's about three bits added to every byte. Um, and it's a, it's a much more heavy duty error correcting code. Um, and it's used on flash drives, and it's used when you download stuff, and all that. So basically, it's one reason why these things need to be used because they say it's a whole lot of But it does mean, because I mean, who's going to rely on a tiny piece of that particle to just say exactly how it is? And so these, these codes mean that even if things are going on, you can detect it. Um, actually, another great example for the error correction is this barcodes and so on. Um, so, the ISDN number of a book, the last digit of that is a checksum. So just, I just, for a brief, how many people are familiar with checksums? Okay. So, so basically, if th this book here, it's, it's, I, its book number is 9780973131, whatever. Um, to work out that last digit 9, what you do is you take each digit and say 97809, Nine, and you multiply them alternately by 1, by 3, by 1, by 3, by 1, by 3, by 1, by 2, and so on. And you add that number up, you divide it by 10, and you find out what the remainder is, you subtract it from 10, and that tells you what that digit should be. Now that seems like a lot of arithmetic to go through for no particular point, but the point is that if I went into a shop, and, or if, if I go online and I say, I want to order Textbook number, you know, nine seven eight zero nine six three one. You know, I type it wrong. It will put it through this equation, and it will say, "Well, hang on a minute, it, the number at the end doesn't add up." And so you must have typed it wrong. And that's what's happening on barcodes. You scan a barcode, and if it doesn't add up, then it knows that it, you know maybe there's a bit of ice on your frozen peas or something like that. It's, it's made it read it wrong. Um, so again, great, great exercise. Oh, that's right. This is an Excel. <laughs> Um, so All right. um, credit card numbers also do this. So basically, there we go. Um, so here's a credit card number. Uh, it's a slightly different algorithm. It's all on Wikipedia and online, so it's easy to find it. Um, so, so there's a particular credit card number spelled out down there. You multiply the first digit by two, the next by one, the next by two, the next by one. And if it's a double digit, you add the two digits together. Okay, so if it comes out as 14, then you call it a five. You add all of those up, and you take the remainder um, 10, in other words, just take the last digit, and if that's zero, then, the, then it's a credit card number. So in other words, if I type that credit card number into a website, it can do that if that's some straight away and say, sorry, you made a mistake with your typing, which is much faster than going to look it up in a database and you know, eventually coming back and saying, hey, that's not valid, or even you know, worse saying, I'll charge it to that credit card. Um, so that's another good example of error detection uh, in everyday life. Can you do a reverse of that and therefore generate what seems to be a valid program? Easily, yes. Yes, your students with this knowledge would help you be able to write a program that generates large numbers of valid credit card numbers. Um, and, and the thing is, of course, 1 in 10 
our billet, uh, you know, just because it's a bit less digital, it's critical. Uh, so you could just actually go through every possible number and suck out the routine from the visitor. But, um, and, 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 but then the questions that computer scientists ask are, you know, what are the chances of this, um, you know, failing? Actually, So, it, so that is a valid credit card number. Okay. For those who are writing it down, that's actually my one. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not me. You're probably better off if you try and use it. Um, but, if, but if I type them in wrong, um, you know, if I, well, so one question is, is there one wrong digit I can type in here and it will still come out right? Okay. And you can sort of do that experimentally. You can say, well, that zero comes out as a zero there. You know, what if I try a five instead? Oh, no, that, you know, the, Sums, sums out of five. And, and after a while, you know, your students are going to work out that in fact this, there is no digit that you can change that will still give the right checksum. Okay. So this will always detect if one digit is typed wrong. Um, what about two? Uh, exactly. And that's the kind of questions that we want your students to ask. Okay. You can look it up on Wikipedia and there's answers to that and it's not straightforward, but it's, the answer is a lot of the time. There are particular problems that can occur. I think it's like if a 5 5 changes to a 7 7, and you know, a few things like that, that, that will fall it. But they're not the kind of errors people make when they type it in. And it's not intended to find fraudulent numbers. You know, if you, uh, it's just to basically say, did you type it in wrong? So, you know, one of the consequences of this is that when you go to an online shopping site and you quickly type in your credit card number, um, and, you know, it, it's where you always sort of Particularly when you're depositing something in someone's bank account for trading, mm -hmm. you, you type in their bank account and you think, I really want to make sure this is right. There's actually one chance in 10 that if you, sorry, nine chances in 10, nine times out of 10, if you made a mistake, the bank will tell you straight away, sorry, that wasn't a bank account number. Uh, now, you don't really want to risk it too much, but there's a good chance that they'll detect before you even get anywhere that you've made a mistake, uh, let alone looking it up. You know, if I'm depositing with one bank into another one, they can't actually go and look up at that bank and say, you know, whose account is this and so on straight away. Um, but, yeah, and, and, and so, so there's all these questions that come up. And what can we now do now that we've got these things called checksums? And the other place that they get used a lot, so the checksum is just this last digit that, you know, is not part of the actual account number, it's something that's generated based on all the other digits. Um, they use the, the trains in New Zealand uh, that have numbers. Um, I don't know if they still do this, I know they definitely do this in Germany, but the numbers on the side of the trains, the last digit is a checksum. So if someone's sort of doing all the signaling and they say, oh, train number 4492 it needs to you know, go here, and they type 4492, it can say, hang on, you know, there's a typo there. Uh, you know, oh, sorry, it's 4462, you're upside down. Um, so, um, it, it, it's also used for, but more importantly, it's used for downloads. Um, so when you go to download a file, there is a checksum generated based on every byte in that file. And so when the whole thing comes through, if that sum isn't the same as what they say it should be, you know that either something's gone wrong in the download or <coughs> there, there, there's an element of security because you can actually say, well, I think I downloaded the right file, but the original author says that the checksum should be this and it's not. So maybe someone's given me a, a, a version of a virus or something like that. And so if the checksum doesn't match, I'm not various reasons. So, um, you know, they, they, they sort of, they come out all sorts of places where you basically you want to be really, really sure that you've got things right. Um, and, and so that's, that's um, you know, there are the three methods of encoding in the standard, um, and they are sort of generally the three methods that, that we use in computer science, which, which is the error control, um, compression, which is to make things smaller, and encryption is to keep things secret. And in some devices do all three of those things. Like almost every device applies error control to files. So it has a big sort of accurately. Um, often at a very low level that your programs will never see. Um, it's very good you just save a file and it has this done to it. Um, some systems obviously apply compression, you know, photographs and music, um, zip, if you zip up a file, things like that. Uh, make, so, so compression makes things smaller. Error detection 
usually makes things larger. You add more bits, and but the, the value you get from those bits is very much more short. Um, and, and, and by the way, you could do error detection by just sending the file twice. So I could, I could send those bits and then I send them again, and if they're the same both times, then was there no error? Probably. Okay. Um, if there was, if, if there is an error, which one is correct? I don't know. And that's the advantage of something like parity is that it actually enables you to have a half a chance of correcting things. Um, encryption generally leaves the file exactly the same size, but it just substitutes and scrambles all the stuff that's in it so that no one can figure out what's there. Um, these resources terminate yeah. on... They're, they're all on the exact thing. So if you look under our favourites, you'll find a link to it. So the, this formula here, for example, um, in fact, the exact... Um, it's a site called Illuminations, um, and it, it, it spells out how to do it. Um, if you, by the way, if you use this particular site here, they use this credit card as an example, it turns out that the number on that's wrong. It took me ages to... It's like I couldn't get it working, and then I realised that they actually chose one that was wrong as an example to, to prove that it was a fake credit card. Um, just read the instructions. <laughs> um, but that's... NCTM is the... Um, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, I think, in America. And uh, so, I mean, from their point of view, this is just a great arithmetic exercise. Um, but from another point of view, it's a great spreadsheet exercise or programming exercise. But the computer scientist says, you know, how, how severe an error can it detect? Uh, how reliable is it? Can you get around the system? Can you exploit it to generate credit card numbers and so on? Yeah. Um, and what should we do to avoid that? Um, yeah. So when you see our favourites, it's, it's like all cool stuff like this. Um, now for compression, um, in, the way the standard is worded is they don't so much need to know how it's done as just simply what the point of it is, but I think it's nice to touch on how it's done. And there are lots of different ways of doing it, but one of the examples we have in Unplugged is just um, you know, when, when you look at images, um, so the system that fax machines use is particularly straightforward. Um, so it, it basically just goes to <coughs> the right image, and instead of just, you know, you could have 0 for white and 1 for black, it could just go 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, and so on. And very quickly, you'd probably invent a system that was a bit more efficient than that. So if you wanted to transmit this image to your friends here, you know, what are the ways you'd do it? Yeah, how many white? Yeah, so you've, after, after you've done this for a few hours, you probably start saying, oh, just six white and six black and eight white and four black and so on, very quickly. And that, in fact, is the technique used by running, it's called running code used by fax machines. So here's an image of the letter A, and that's going to probably blow some of your students' minds. That's not the ASCII letter A, but it's an image of the ASCII letter A. Um, and the coding for it is that you know, there's one white pixel and three black and one white pixel. Uh, now, a bitmap image, which is uncompressed, would store that as 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. Um, but a GIF, well, uh, sorry, yeah, GIF and TIFF images and so on that use compression are more clever. They don't actually use exactly the that method there, but um, something related to that. Um, and, and so we end up with these numbers here, you know, four white pixels and one black. And there's, there's questions like, you know, that 0 there, why have we got 0 there? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the assumption here is every line starts with white, um, mm -hmm. which for a fax is pretty normal because you have white margins on a page. But if it happens to start with black, you need to send to zero to say there are no white ones. Now get into the black. Um, now, your students would probably write programs that generate and decode these things, right? It's just counting stuff. Um, you know, if, if the input that you give them is something like white, 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 black, 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 white, 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 or um, maybe an ASCII that have dot, 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 at sign, at sign, at sign, dot, dot, dot. Then when they display that text file on the screen, it'll actually look like the image. But to write a program that counts those, um, and if it's, it's the level two stuff says array, so you might even say, oh, load the entire image into, a, into an array, um, you know, and print out those values. 
or if I give you those values, you can those things. And so suddenly you've now got an exercise where they're actually engaging with compression. They're doing some programming, so they're using arrays, uh, but you need to use modules for it, which are required at this level and so on. Uh, and you, so you combine the standards. Now, that's not all required. It would be enough for them just to talk about <coughs> how big uh, a JPEG is compared with the bitmap image. Uh, but to me, it would be kind of an um, engaging exercise to actually implement some, something like that. Um, <coughs> yeah, so then one of the videos uh, we've got is. Um, showing, so this is on the Unplugged site, there's a whole channel called um, YouTube slash CS Unplugged, youtube.com slash CS Unplugged, um, and uh, we actually got a kit to do it on the side of a school building, <laughs> um, and to uh, transmit a message. Um, so there's the original one, and they converted it to, you know, and then, in fact, we had kids, oh, oh, take you show, but hey, kids wearing black and white t-shirts running out telling the other kid how many of these pixels are doing and so um, By the way, the videos there, um, apart from that um, music one that I showed you, most of the videos are aimed at teachers. They're saying, if you did this in your classroom, this is what it would look like. Um, it, it's a bit more boring to say, hey kids, here's some kids doing an exercise, watch them do it and take notes. You know, so it's really just to give you an idea of uh, ideas for, for how to actually do this in the classroom. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Hi. We're just heading over to put morning tea out now. So if you want to see me from one over about a quarter two. Okay. Thanks, sir. three characters, so the A becomes D and B becomes E and so on. It's a really bad encryption method, it's very easy to break, but it teaches all of the concepts surrounding encryption. So one of the concepts is the idea of a key. An encryption key is the number you need to know to decode it, and for a Caesar cipher the key is three, that we need to know the move it by three. And you could do a Caesar cipher that ships by five, okay, um, and the key is the number five. Now, we have a brute force attack on this, which would involve trying out every possible key. There are only 26 possible keys. And so your students could write a program that goes through these characters and adds one to every character, prints that out, it's rubbish, adds two, prints that out, it's rubbish, adds three, and it, it comes out as plain text. And so they know, and, and they can see that, that, that. But a real compression system uses 128 bit keys. We go back to the other standard. How many combinations of 128 bits are there? Googlean quantities, okay. Um, how long would it take a program trying out a million keys every second to attack that? A billion years or something like that. Um, that would be a great project, you know, um, because they've actually, maybe they've timed their system to try out lots of possibilities. They can say, oh, it tries out a thousand every second. So it would only take, you know, a million years to, to, to crack this code. It's a brute force attack. Um, a statistical attack says some letters are more common than others. So, what do you think the letter, well, what letter's going to stop in here? Why? Why? Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so, in fact, what you do is write a program that just counts how often each letter occurs. That's a great exercise. And, and you'll find out what the most common character is and say, well, that's probably the letter E. Um, and once you've got one letter, probably you crack the whole code. It's one of the big mistakes the Germans made. Um, during World War II is that they liked to put Heil Hitler at the end of every message. <laughs> and so the English knew that you know, there'd be Heil Hitler there and that they, you know, it's, it's called a plain, non and plain text attack. Okay? Um, you know, if you know what the text is, then you can actually... <laughs> uh, there are problems with being methodical about things. Um, and, and, but, yeah, so it's a really bad way of encoding things. Um, but, uh, by the way, if you do the statistics, it turns out the letter O is space is most common, but the letter O is uh, probably, and then there's other things like, you know that you know, a letter on its own is probably either the letter A or I, and things like that. Um, and so, now we've got this terminology, the plain text, that's the thing that was encoded, the cipher text, that was the stuff that you couldn't read, the attack is trying to figure out, and, and this, this is the terminology that um, people use, 
Uh, a known plain text attack where you, you somehow force someone to encode something for you, um, and either by knowing what they're going to say or by transmitting uh, something through their system. Um, brute force attack where you try out every possible code frequency mask. And, 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 you know, and suddenly, again, not desperately required for the curriculum, but if, if your students wrote a project where they sort of talked about the different ways they did, they tried that on a cipher that the teacher had given them, then they obviously understood what the curriculum is. Uh, yeah. And, and, and the issues around Okay, the last one, which I've already talked about a fair bit, is human computer interaction. And I can talk about this today because there's so much wrong with interfaces. But the, it's, the, the standard says to use a set of heuristics, um, you know, heuristics and guidelines, and Nielsen's ones are by far the most widely used and respected and very straightforward. Um, and, and it's just a list of 10 things that say that a good interface should do these things. Um, the URL for this is usit.com. Uh, or is it usit.org? It's usit.com. Okay. Um, I mean, it's probably, you know, the heuristic. Um, usit.com. Yeah. Usability heuristic. Um, and uh, this is the, the devices in general, the programs, and then we've got heuristics for websites and things like that. Um, but you know, just to pull out a couple of examples, um, one of them is there should be a match between the system and the real world, and you know, speak the user's language. So, for example, uh, my bank, which gets paid every time I make some HCI error because I use it as an example here, um, I typed in 1,471 as an amount, and it said the amount is incorrect. Okay. Um, in my language, in an accounting language, in most people's language, a comma in a, in a 1,400 is correct. And it's basically saying, no, sorry, that's not a number. And you can see where that comes from. A programmer just writes something that says, really <coughs> right, instead of reading the characters and converting it to a number by being very clever. Um, and so um, it, it's saying, that's not a number. For many users, they'll go, yes, it is. Uh, can't see what's wrong with that. This bank doesn't even know what number it is. Uh, and you know, it's going to damage the reputation of the organization. For me, it's like, oh, here's a great example. Um, so, very easy for these um, systems to, to break those heuristics. Um, golden rule, one of the heuristics there is consistency in standards. The same words, actions, and, and different situations should be the same. Thing. So, Copy and paste are the case of these but Once you know how to do copy and paste, it almost always works in every piece of software, uh, except Microsoft Excel. Um, and it's no wonder that students struggle with copy and paste in Excel. It, it, is, it is not consistent with how it happens everywhere else. Um, the, and this is a cell phone that I have a um, lot of usable examples from. The, I type in a text message, and what do you want to do to a text message? Send. Pressing the send button actually means I want to make a phone call. Wipe everything I've done and make a phone call. <laughs> and and so, you know, there's a lot of psychology in this, but psychologically it's very hard not to press the send button when you have to send the message. Yeah. Right, I hope that was helpful. Um, Thank you so much. Thank And for those of you around in December, um, we've managed to get a two-day workshop out of Google where we can talk about all these things in a lot more detail. 12th and 13th of December, registration's hopefully out in a few days. Um, and we'll have people like we'll the Google engineers who'll talk about why they care about this sort of thing, the uh, ministry. Um, and I'm hoping to get a demo from our wine pruning guys, wine pruning guys, including and
Brilliant. 